Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it's Saturday. That means it's time for Nita Notes, my weekly vlog series about limited magic, talking about some more Bloomboro today. And we've got enough data now that I can take a look back at my set review and talk about 10 cards that I think I got wrong. So it's always kind of a fun exercise because, you know, it helps me think about limited, what I might be able to do better in future set reviews, but also, you know, it gives us an idea of what specifically is going on in this format and why I got these cards wrong and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and dive right in and we'll start with the card that I hinted last week that I already knew would be on the list and that is Carrot Cake. So I gave Carrot Cake a C. I thought it would be a solid card, especially in the um, Rabbit deck because I thought the rate of, you know, pay four total mana, get two one ones, gain three life and scry twice. I thought that seemed like a pretty solid rate though. Not anything insane, but it turns out I'm just wrong. Um, you know, the amount of value you get, like, you know, you wouldn't... It's true, you wouldn't play a two-mana 1-1 one, one that scries one. You probably wouldn't play that card, at least not be very happy about it. But this just has so much more going on, partly because later it can give you another one and gain you some life, and partly because there are some other things you can do with it that make it even better. You know, black-green is the color pair for forage, right? But you can end up with forage cards in green white or black white and if you're doing that foraging carrot cake is what feels truly insane because you sacrifice it you don't have to pay any mana and while you don't gain the life you still get another rabbit out of it and a scry and at that point you've paid two mana for two one ones and scry two which is well above rate plus it has all these little synergy points you know it gains you life which the black white deck likes goes wide which both red white and green white like and like i said it's a uh, food which you care about you know while black green is really the only color pair that really cares about food it's not like this deck other decks that have green or black in them can't use food so you just end up getting a really good rate a card that can help you stabilize when you're behind like if you draw it late and you just pay all of it all at once tends to feel pretty good. Improving your draws, you know, scry two total out of this. That in and of itself feels like it's almost a card worth the value. I mean, it gets close. It's probably not quite there, but it gets close. Really improves the quality of your draws, whether you're trying to use it to hit your third land drop or to keep from flooding out. You're going to feel pretty good about whatever this card does for you. So then also I should mention, you know, not only does green white care about going wide, it has several cards that care about tokens specifically, and if you can get them online, especially between the one mana 1-2 one, that can attack as a 3-2, and the three mana 2-3 that becomes a 4-3 trample, like if Carrot Cake is the play you wedge between those two, it's just a gross early game that makes life very difficult. So, Carrot Cake, way better than I thought. Gave it a C. It's more like a B-. minus. It's one of the best commons in the set. Uh, it's just a very good card. Speaking of white cards that I was wrong about um at common <laughs> there's also wax wayne witness so i gave this a c plus and i think i even had it when i did my three best white commons i think it might have been my third best white common yeah it's not um you know i didn't think it was going to be insane or anything as a c plus grade will tell you but i felt like the four mana two four flying vigilance rate was like enough for me to feel pretty good about playing it then I reasoned that it's a flyer, which the blue-white deck cares about. And I also really liked, and sometimes this does really go off, I really liked that for each instance of life gain, it gets plus one, plus zero, instead of being capped at like once per turn. Or it's not a, if you gain life this turn, it's just each time you gain life, this happens, or lose life for that matter. So, you know, early on in the format, when I did that video, when I was like three or four drafts in or whatever, it had performed pretty well for me, and it was a card I was pretty satisfied with. But as I continued to play it, it started to not feel that good. There's just a lot of reasonably efficient flyers at similar mana costs that can attack through it, for example. There's also, you know, lots of removal that can kill a four drop in this format for two or three mana, which is a big tempo hit because it doesn't give you any value up front or when it dies. So, you know, it's not an unplayable card by any stretch. You know, the overall win rate in this format for 17 lands users is 54.9%. So that's sort of the baseline we're judging against, not against 50%. And when you consider that, sure, it is worse than that, but not by a lot. You know, I think it's a fine card. You're probably hoping for a better four drop in your white decks, even if you're black white, but it's an okay one to run. So I think it's like a C minus in the end. You know, you ideally don't play it that often, but it's not a disaster to play. It's just, you know, not white's third best common and certainly 
you know, not a card that you ever really feel excited about having. Next, let's look at what has the highest win rate in the format right now, because it's a card I got wrong. Although I will say, I got the most pushback I've ever gotten on the Top 10 Bombs video about including Fecund Green Shell on that list. Like, so many people, at least eight or nine comments of people telling me I'm completely insane and don't know what I'm talking about because I put the Green Shell on the list. It has the third highest win rate in the format. I'm just throwing that one out there. I did get that. I got most of the Bombs on the list right, actually. I just didn't get this one right because I didn't give it even a bomb grade in the set review. Uh, and that card is Season of Loss. So this has a whopping 65.9% win rate. Uh, I gave it a B plus in the set review. So it's not like I thought it would be bad. But I just didn't think there would be enough situations where this gives you um, like a game winning effect. Like, you know, I saw the upside. There's this mode where you can just use it as a five mana both players lose all their creatures assuming they have five or fewer creatures you can also choose to draw cards for creatures that die so you can break the symmetry there like if you choose each player sacks a creature and then you do the two paw mode so you get rid of three of your creatures three of their creatures and draw three like i thought that seemed pretty good and the thing that kind of made me less than enthused about this one the most though is the last mode which is each opponent loses X life where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. I just didn't see that working out that often. Obviously, I saw that there's synergy with chapter one, you know, because you can have two sacks happen, then you do the chap the, the three paw mode, but it just seemed like that was going to be a blank or not powerful enough to use over the other abilities for me to feel kind of like it didn't stand up to as much. It just wasn't as good as the other non-red seasons point is season of loss uh is a lot better than i thought even if that last mode doesn't come up just choosing that first mode is often really powerful especially because the way you can mix and match with it like if your opponent has three creatures and you have five which is what i've seen happen a lot with this card unfortunately and i haven't gotten to play with it yet myself but i have played against it like the game is just over, and there are a lot of situations like that where the person who casts it has more creatures, so they choose modes that allow them to get rid of their opponent's stuff but hold on to their own stuff, and that's really good. But also, like, the three-paw mode is better than I expected, especially in the late game, and especially if you're in, like, black-green and you're casting, you know, things, self-mill effects. Um, that last mode can just end games. It's just hard not to get tons of value out of this that also has a big impact on the board. Like, generally speaking, you cast this, it has a big positive, obviously from the win rate, right? But I'm explaining how it has this positive impact because the modality of it lets you basically always choose either kill some stuff and draw some cards, uh, wipe the opponent's stuff, and I have more left over than they do on board, not just cards in hand, or I just win the game because that's the only time you really choose the three-paw mode. So, yeah, it's been great. It's the biggest bomb in the format with its really, really high win rate. So it's not a B plus, it's an A plus. Let's look at another card, uh, a card that made my bomb list that shouldn't have made the list. Um, and in fact, I had it at number one, so that wasn't so good. It's not like it's a bad card, though. It's Starfall Invocation. Um, I gave it an A. Obviously, that's, you know, that's a bomb grade. And it's more like a B. It has a 57.1% win rate, and overall, you know, sweepers often don't have that high of win rates, unless they're like the one we just looked at, which can be a sweeper, but has all these other modes, right? But the times when we do see sweepers that have really high win rates, they look like Starfall Invocation, where it's a one-sided sweeper, right? You know, like Final Showdown and stuff like that. Basically, destroy everything but your best creature. That's really, really good. But Starfall Invocation, like, and again, it is a good card. It's just certainly not the biggest bomb in the set either. I mean, it has not quite 10% lower win rate than Season of Loss, but it's not a lot different than that either. It's, you know, what, 8% different? So it's pretty far from the mark of being the biggest bomb in the format. And yeah, it can have really powerful modes where you cast it and you win the game, but the thing that makes it awkward is there are lots of times where it's not that good. Um, generally, if you're, if you're at parity or ahead, like, it's not nearly as good. Certainly if you're ahead, there's, like, no reason to cast it at all, right? Um, even if you do hold on to your best creature and they lose their best, you, you lose all of theirs, you do give them a card. 
But if you're at parity, it's not even always great. Like, you do have to have... You know, it does ask you to have a significant creature, right? And that is... That's not guaranteed. Like, if what you're able to do is, yeah, you're, you, you wipe the board, but the best thing you have is, like, a 3-3, three, three, and then you have to give your opponent a gift, and then they, you know, sure, they untap, they don't have a board anymore, but then they just play, like, a 4-drop. Like, <laughs> that, that is not a great sequence, and that can happen with Starfall and Vacation. Now, if you're behind, it's obviously game-breaking. It can win you the game, you know, from really far behind. It can win you the game basically from any board state at all, and it... That means it has this really insane ceiling. But when you look at sort of the different stages of the game, it matters that if you're at uh, parity, it's not even always good. And if you are ahead, there's no reason to cast it. So it has more of the problems that I expected that all sweepers tend to have in limited. Great when you're really, when you're behind at all. Not nearly as good in any other situation. It is better than a lot of them because at parity... You know, normally what stinks is if you're at parity and you blow up the board, your opponent gets to untap and rebuild before you. And while they still might untap and play something better, you do at least have something on the board. So it is a good card. It's like a B, but uh, it's definitely not an A plus or an A. It's not the biggest bomb in the format. Next up, let's look at Bandit's Talent. So um, I did pretty good on the green talents. Those both have ended up being really good, which I expected. Those are great. Didn't do so good on this one, and there's also a white one I'm going to talk about. So, uh, Bandit's Talent. So what's going on here? Well, I thought it would do enough to be a B-, minus. so I thought it would be a pretty good disruptive spell early. And then in the late game, it can help you close out the game with its rack-like effects, you know, that damage your opponent. And it can feel pretty good on, like, turn two. But it does have pretty big diminishing returns. And in the late game, like, imagine if you're either at parity or ahead, uh, or behind, rather, and you play this, and your opponent has no cards in hand, yeah, maybe you level it up all the way. But if they just played something that actually impacted the board on their turn and then do it again on the next turn, you just lost. And it's because you drew this instead of, like, a three mana 3-3, three, three, right? So it can feel pretty good, and it does feel pretty good if you play it early and then level it up later when you have the time. Um, but it has a 53.6% win rate. It's like a C- minus and maybe kind of a build aroundy one where you really only want it in a really controlling deck that can get to the late game and actually use it as a win condition in addition to enjoying the early disruption. Um, another factor, too, and it is something I mentioned in the set review, is like there are two graveyard decks in this format. And helping them get Threshold or Forage online is not necessarily a good thing. While I mentioned that in the set review, that has weighed more. Like, I've had people cast this against me and been pretty happy about it um, more than I expected. And I've cast it and helped somebody, you know, put some value in their graveyard when I didn't really want to. Like, that matters, too. Having two graveyard decks in the format is a problem. If this was a format that was, like, all graveyards, which we've seen in, like, Innistrad sets, like, heavy graveyard formats, um, I think I would have noticed that more or put more, accounted more for that instead of saying, well, sometimes it's going to not be good to help them, but the upside's worth it. But it turns out both the upside's not worth it and helping them is worse than I expected, too. So the other class I want to talk about is Builder's Talent. So I gave this a build around C grade. Um, in other words, I thought if you could end up in a deck that could really utilize Builder's Talent, it would be okay. And to me, that sort of means like you definitely don't want to take it and you don't want to play it in all your white decks and you don't want to take it that early, certainly, because like the ceiling's not that high and you have to end up in just the right deck. And the reason it looks... I was really um, skeptical of it, is it specifically, level 2 and level 3, ask you for non-creature, non-land permanents. And usually you have such a small portion of your deck made up of those that, like, you can't really count on that. And sure, what I did like about this card is that it gives you a body up front, but that body is pretty underwhelming, like, to say the least. 0-4 Defender isn't great, and that's still true about this card. Like, if, if you don't have any non-creature, non-land permanents, you still shouldn't be playing this and just hoping that you can get enough value out of a 2-mana 0-4. It's not going to do that. 
But there are enough non-creature, non-land cards that white decks just like always play. For example, Carrot Cake, Banishing Light, like these are commons, that you are able to get um, counters out of this. Pretty much every white deck can do it. And level three, sure, paying five to get Carrot Cake back isn't the most exciting thing, but like that's pretty good value on a random card you have in play that's already given you a 0-4 and, like, two plus one plus one counters for a total of three mana. And then you just, you know, in the late game when you have nothing better to do, you get back your carrot cake or whatever. And those are just, like, common examples. There are other things. Obviously, food works really well with this. Again, white's not exactly a food deck, but you do have random cards in green and in black that give you food that you're going to be playing with this. And the more of those you have, the better it gets. Same is true of treasure, though there's not a lot of it in the format. Basically, I just didn't see that there is enough of an emphasis, especially in white, of good non-creature, non-lands for level two and level three on this to actually matter. So the fact that you get like an okay-ish passable kind of body early and then some serious value out of this late, it's better than I expected. So it's not really a build around card is what I would say. Like I thought you'd have to build around it and it wouldn't be that exciting. Turns out basically any white deck can use it. I mean... If you end up in a white deck that has no non-creature, non-lands, obviously you can't use it. But my point is, you just don't end up in that deck. Like, you don't even have to try that hard. Just take the good commons and uncommons, and builder's talent will work in your deck most of the time. So, not only is it not a build-around, but it probably is more like a C+, with its 56.2% win rate. So, you know, it sneaks right into being a perfectly good early-ish pick, like... You don't want a first or second pick it most of the time, but third pick on is not a terrible idea, and it should move up in your pick order the more carrot cakes and the like that you have. So another couple of cards I want to look at, which actually gives us 11 total cards in this video instead of 10, but I wanted to look at these cards together because you'll see why. So those two cards are Cash Grab and Peerless Recycling. So both of these are cards that you spend two mana on, and you get a permanent back from your graveyard. They have some additional upside than that. Um, Peerless Recycling, if you gift your opponent a card, you can get a second permanent back. Okay. Uh, and Cash Grab, meanwhile, mills four, and it, it also doesn't let you get any permanent back the way Peerless Recycling does. Has to be one of the ones you mill. But also, if you have a squirrel in play or a squirrel in your graveyard, you get a food. Um, one of these is a common, and one of them is an uncommon. <laughs> and... You would think the Uncommon might have the higher win rate, but it does not. Peerless Recycling is significantly worse than Cash Grab is. I gave it a C plus in my set review because I sort of saw it as a nice late game effect that you want one of in a lot of your green decks. Because, I thought, giving your opponent a card, on average, um, is going to be worth getting back a second permanent. Like a permanent that's better, theoretically, than the card they have. And that can happen. You know, Peerless Recycling is sometimes... You know, you, the thing to remember with all of these, because oftentimes when I talk about data or my experience with the card over, you know, dozens of drafts or whatever, oftentimes the counter is, well, it won me the game once. <laughs> and that's true. Like, every Magic card... And, you know, there are some that are always bad, but every Magic card can have times where it is good and it does the thing. Like, if you cast Cash Grab and you get back two bombs and give your opponent some random card, it's going to be amazing. But the things it doesn't have going on for it, first, it doesn't help you get cards in your graveyard, which is something green decks, especially black green, want to be doing. That's something that Cash Grab does do. Uh, furthermore, it doesn't give you food, which has some legitimate, very real upside in black green decks in this format. So it kind of has a higher ceiling. It does have a higher ceiling, really, where you can get back two insane things and you can choose from any permanence in your graveyard, right? But Cash Grab has a way higher floor. And I do think Cash Grab is like a build around because you can't really play it if you're not in black green. Um, you need to have enough payouts for loading the graveyard and enough payouts for food or it's not worth playing. Peerless Recycling, um, you can probably play in a wider variety of decks, but it's going to be pretty underwhelming most of the time. But when you do play Cash Grab in the right deck, it is incredibly good because it ends up having basically the same effect as Peerless Recycling for the same cost, except you also load your graveyard and get a food, <laughs> which is insane. Like, that upside for two mana is, is a lot, especially at instant speed. 
Um, so, you know, I gave Peerless Recycling a C plus originally. It's performing more like a D minus, I would say, maybe even worse than that. And Cash Grab, I gave just a straight up C two. And I, it's interesting, I didn't give it a build around grade because there are a lot of build arounds in this format that I probably could have been more liberal using build around grades with and I should have here. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think Cash Grab with its 58.8% win rate, which I think largely reflects people are mostly only playing it in the Squirrel deck. Um, that makes it like a build around B minus and a card you can take pretty early because even if you don't end up in like a heavy squirrel deck, it's okay. Like it's usually still going to be better than peerless recycling. Like it's probably like a C minus or a D plus in a non squirrel deck. So, you know, it has this really high ceiling, um, not as high as peerless recycling admittedly, but it has a very high one, uh, and a very reasonable floor. So cash grab has been really good. And that's part of too, like, why would you even play Peerless Recycling when, you know, you can get like two cash grabs really easily and the recycling is just significantly worse. All right, let's look now at Alania's Pathmaker. So this one is one that in my set review, uh, there were a few people in the comments who were like, it's not that good. And I think in some ways we were both right. <laughs> not really, I was, more, I was more wrong than right. But I give the Pathmaker a B minus in the set review. Why? Well, it's a four mana four two that draws you a card. That's pretty good, right? And it is. Like, that's that's a nice card overall. But there's a big problem here, and that is red, broadly speaking, in this format. So the reason I say we're both kind of right, because a lot of people said, like, it's it's not very good, like you're not gonna want to play it in your red decks. Well, I don't think that's true, because it's the third has the third highest win rate of all red commons. It's just that red is not so good. <laughs> it's the worst color in this format. It has some serious issues. Um, I talked some, especially about how blue red is really not working. And that's, you know, that would make the otter, this otter even better because it is an otter. So it would make the blue red deck even better. Um, so when you look at how red's performing and what the Pathmaker's win rate is, it's not that bad. But I do want to highlight the Pathmaker as a card because, like, it shows you that red collectively is not a great color in this format. You can draft red, and I especially like the Pathmaker in, like, red-green, like, because it triggers expend, and then sometimes it can help set up an expend trigger next turn. It's a card I play, um, but it's not a B-. minus. Like, once we have enough data about what colors are good and what colors are bad on average in a limited format, we have to start adjusting our grades for sure. And the Pathmaker goes from being like a B minus level card if red was like an average <laughs> color to being like a C. So, you know, you shouldn't take it early in a vacuum. Pathmaker looks like it would be a good card and it is good for red in this set, but it's not, it's not that good uh, overall. Next, let's look at Finch Formation. So this is another one. So the Pathmaker I had is one of red's best commons and I do think that actually is true. I think I may have had it at number one, though, and it's not its not quite that good. Um, Finch Formation, I think I had as Blue's third best common, and it hasn't really panned out either. Um, this just really goes to show you, you know, I keep hoping these Windrakes with Upside will bring back the Windrake glory days of old, but Finch Formation kind of doesn't, it doesn't do it. And, you know, it's a three-mana 2-2 two -two flyer. When it enters, gives flying to something. And in the later game, you can pay even more mana to get a 1-1 one -one and give two things flying. I envisioned this giving me enough scenarios where it could win me the game late and help me get in for some damage early while also being a decent attacker. It can trigger Valiant. Um, it can work with flying, non-flying payoffs. It has a useful creature type. Like, all of these things made me think, okay, this Windrake will actually work out. But it just hasn't. You end up with a lot of turns. Like, if you have to run this out on three, it feels actively bad for the same reason, like, all three mana 2-2s two do these days that don't always have an impactful ETB or death trigger. And that's because not only are they, like, bad blockers against this world where we have two threes all the time for two mana, and they also die to much cheaper removal. Um, and that ETB just isn't always useful. Like maybe you get in with your two drop or whatever for a hit that you couldn't otherwise, but that's pretty low impact, like when you play this on three. And there are times where you play it late and it does win you the game. Like, of course it does. It gives flying to two of your creatures. If you have a well-built up board and you have two creatures that gain, you know, gaining flying wins you the game, it's going to win you the game. 
but you have to account for how bad it feels on three. And even, even when you do pay the um, offspring kicker late, it's not always going to do something. It also doesn't help that there's a lot of reach in this format. They've been giving us a lot of reach lately. They've powered down flying. You know, we did just have a really good flying deck in, in um, Modern Horizons 3, I guess, but it does feel like a reach is, like, everywhere lately, and that makes a card like this a lot worse, too. So, yeah, I mean, it's just too inefficient, whether you're casting it regularly or casting it late. It has its moments, but it's, you know, I gave it a C plus. It's a D minus. And then the last card I want to look at is emblematic of, again, red being bad, but also blue-red more broadly, and that is Kindle Spark Duo. It has by far the lowest win rate of any card on this list at 49.4%. Um, and I gave it a C plus in the set review. Again, you know, looking at this card in a vacuum, uh, it helps set up black-red synergies in terms of if your opponent took damage, good stuff happens. Sets that up. And you can do a bunch of damage with it if you're in a spell deck. And indeed, one of my earliest drafts in this format, I had a bunch of pingers, and it went pretty well with these. Um, again, I'm not saying these cards can never win you games. They just don't when we look at the big picture. They don't win you enough compared to other cards you could be playing. And blue-red, broadly, has been a very bad color pair in the format, to the point that I think it's almost safe to say that there are only nine playable color pairs in this format. I mean, you know... If you get some red and blue bombs, then you can play it. But that's pretty much what you need, or you're actively playing a color pair that just is too weak. And it, the non-creature spell stuff just doesn't work out. Um, there's just not enough that's powerful. Uh, a three-mana one-three is is so inefficient. You know, I didn't mention it when talking about um, the three-mana two-two flyer, but like the good tricks in this format make a creature that's understated even worse because you know you you can't even block two twos you can't block some one drops or two drops in this format without getting blown out by a trick or something um and so a three mana one three is pretty miserable and you might be saying well black red is a pretty good deck and i'd say yeah it is a pretty good deck but you don't really want a three mana one three in it <laughs> it's an aggro deck where you just want to be curving out with your lizards and sure you want to be damaging your opponent but you know the best way to do that just turn them sideways. <laughs> you don't want to set up an inefficient creature that you have to tap to do it, and you're not going to untap it that much in black-red either. So blue-red is definitely where this was supposed to be good, and that's reflected in its very bad, very bad win rate. So those are the cards I got wrong uh, in Bloomborough. There are more, of course, but these are the 10 that I thought would be most instructive for us to discuss. As usual, I'll be back next week where we take a deeper dive into the data when we've got even more of it, and we can start to look at cards that are being undervalued or overvalued based on how they're actually performing. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to catch up on past videos, including my set review, me talking about the best commons and uncommons in this set, even though I was off on some of those, you can see a playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.